It's my honor to introduce Kate Mingoya, class of 2008, Director of Capacity Building at Groundwork USA, a national environmental justice network. She leads the Climate Safe Neighborhoods Partnership, a data-informed organizing process that aims to reduce heat and flooding-related risks in neighborhoods with histories of institutional race-based housing discrimination. After graduating from Reed, Kate taught middle school science in the South Bronx and in East New York, earned a degree in urban planning from MIT, and worked as the Director of Policy and Program Development for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts State Aided Public Housing Portfolio. I'm going to turn it over to Kate. Hello. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Alumni College. Thank you for choosing to spend this morning or afternoon, depending on where you are with me, as we talk about hot, wet American racism uh, or why your neighborhood looks the way that it does and what we should do about it. Um, as Amy said, I graduated in 2008 as a biology major, and I'm really thrilled to spend some time with you. Before we get started, before we pop into our breakout rooms, I wanted to start with this image of Cincinnati, Ohio. It's right near the Ohio River, if you're familiar with the area. And I want you to think to yourself, if you are hanging out in Cincinnati on a really hot summer's day, where in this picture would you want to hang out? If you're like me, you probably want to be on the left side of the Staten line. There is a dense tree canopy cover, some beautiful verdant grass, and there's even a swimming pool in the lower left-hand corner. But you might also notice a couple other things. You might also notice that the picture is mostly residential, but why is it on the left-hand side you can see trees as far as the eye can see, whereas in the right-hand corner you can see residential buildings with dead trees, not a lot of grass, and not a lot of green resources to help bring down the temperature. Um, well, that's going to be a lot of what we're going to talk about today, because we know that the consequences of our changing climate are not being felt equally from state to state within our country, from city to city within our states, and not even from neighborhood to neighborhood within the same city. And that's not a coincidence. We're going to kick it off by uh, going into breakout rooms. Uh, there was some optional homework, and if you did not do it, that is fine. Uh, we're going to look at some historical redlining maps. And just a quick note that if you're not familiar with redlining maps, I got you. We're going to talk about the high level and the nuance in a couple minutes when we get back. Um, but if you didn't get a chance to hop on the website, we're going to drop the mapping inequality link in the chat. You can just click on it and go to, you're going to see a page like the one that's up on the screen and just go to a city that you care about um, or maybe one that you live in if, if it's up there. Portland is a really great one if you don't see your city listed. So we're going to drop that link in the chat. If you didn't get a chance to review, just go find the map real quick right now. And as a really quick note, what you're going to see are a variety of colors. And all that you really need to know in these maps, which were produced in the, during the Great Depression, um, is that green generally tended to be areas that were whiter, or the definition of whiteness at the time, because we know that that changes, uh, and had better quality housing stock, whereas neighborhoods that were outlined in red tended to have a lot of people of color and lower quality housing stock. Um, and so in your groups, in your breakout groups, I just want you to chat about these questions and, and note that the person whose birthday is next should be the first person to speak, just to break the ice there. Um, and I want you to think, what strikes you about how your neighborhoods were graded? Which ones had wealthier, whiter areas? Which ones had um, black, brown, and lower income neighborhoods? Are there any demographic similarities between the way that the map represents those communities in the 1930s and the way that your neighborhood, these neighborhoods look today? And which neighborhoods do you think of as hot versus cold or wet versus dry? Have any neighborhoods gentrified? So we're going to break into our breakout rooms for about 10 minutes, uh, have a chat with folks about these questions. We're going to drop them in the chat as well, so no need to scribble them down. Um, and we'll see you back here in about 10 minutes. All right. Well, welcome back, everyone. Thanks so much. I got to pop into your conversations, and it was so rich, just exactly the caliber that I would expect when you get a lot of readies to, to stick around and talk about weird things that have happened in the past. Um, we're going to get a chance in the question and answer session to dig into some of these related to your community, but I wanted to dig in and give you the big picture. And just as a little bit of background and some context for the work that I do, uh, I work for an organization called Groundwork USA, which is a national network of 21 people-centered environmental justice organizations usually in the second or third largest city in any given state. You can hop on our website to see if we have one near you. And generally the work that we do is to put residents in the driver's seat around making changes to their built environment so that their neighborhoods can look and feel like the safe and clean and healthy places that they want them to. And that's everything from densifying the urban tree canopy to taking over brownfields, which are plots of land that are contaminated or suspected to be contaminated and turning them into community assets like parks and trails and urban farms. And more recently into climate mitigation 
conversation. And over the last three years, we've gotten to ask this pretty important question. Is there a relationship between historical race-based housing segregation? And we can use redlining as a proxy for that, but I'm gonna talk more about how there's lots of different ways to evaluate it. And then modern day risk from the climate crisis. Um, and part of our Climate Safe Neighborhoods Partnership pulls together nine cities across the country to help understand whether or not that's the case and figure out what to do about it. And I promised that I was gonna give those of you who or maybe you're familiar with redlining, but it's been a minute, or maybe you're not super familiar with it, a really, really quick rundown. So I want all of us to go back in time. We're time traveling to the Great Depression. And at this point, folks are really struggling. And they're struggling not just to not having enough money to meet their basic needs, but to also stay in their homes. Back in the 1920s, 30s, you didn't have access to the 30-year mortgage that allows you to spread out debt over a really long period of time. What they had instead is you would get a mortgage for about five years, and over time, you pay down the principal, and at the end of the five years, you'd have, to, you'd have a really big balance left over, and you would have to get another loan. By 1933, 50, that's 5-0% of homes we're in default. So folks don't have enough money to meet their basic needs and there is a huge foreclosure crisis. So as part of the New Deal programming, the federal government says, hey, lenders, we really want you to lend to these folks to keep them in their home and to allow folks to build their intergenerational wealth. We know that property ownership is a big way that we do that in our culture. Um, so in order to make lending easier, we're gonna back the loan. What that means is, hey, if this borrower over here defaults, the federal government is gonna pick up the tab of tax dollars but they're tax dollars. So the federal government has to figure out which places are risky bets that we might lose money and which places are safe bets. So they established the Homeowners Loan Corporation, which goes to major American cities, about 100,000 residents or higher is it's sort of the cutoff for, for cities that had been redlined. Um, and they went into these cities and designated places that were uh, risky, but that they considered to be risky um, and where you could not get access to this federally backed debt. Uh, they would outline that in red or redline it. Uh, those neighborhoods that were whiter, wealthier, had higher quality housing stock, they would outline it in green or green line it. So this creates a really tricky problem for people who live in these redlined areas. Imagine that you're a resident who uh, wants to buy a home in a redlined area. You all of a sudden don't have access to this debt that other people in these other neighborhoods have access to. Um, so that means it's gonna be a lot harder for you to buy that property. If you are someone who already owns your property and you wanna sell it, no one's gonna be able to get mortgage debt and it's gonna make it a lot harder for them to get you the price that you want for your home. And if you're a family that has enough money, say to move over to a green lined area where maybe it looks a little bit better, the quality of housing is a little bit better and you're a family of color, you're not gonna be able to get a mortgage. Realtors are gonna keep you out and the banks are gonna keep you out because your presence could downgrade the entire neighborhood, uh, putting other people's mortgages at risk. So you can't buy, you can't sell, and you can't leave. And something I really wanna make clear is that redlining did not cause segregation. It just codified pre-1917 boundaries that cities had put in place, uh, segregating races in the United States and major American cities. And we see in neighborhoods that were historically redlined that there's this financial disincentive of the cities to invest in these neighborhoods. You don't see as many parks cited there. You don't see as much tree canopy cover there. In some cases, they don't even upgrade the sewer system. And that's for a lot of reasons. People in those neighborhoods, their property values are not adding a lot to the coffers of the city. They don't have a lot of political power, probably because of their race or their immigration status, so they can be uh, ignored and their resource, the resources that the city has won't be sent their way. Occasionally folks ask me and they say like, Kate, are you sure that this is about race? Because if I were a bank, I would probably wanna make sure the housing stock was in good condition, right? You get an appraisal right now if you get a 30 year mortgage. If you have a home, you're probably a beneficiary of this program and you probably had an appraisal done on your home. That's where the clarifying remarks or the notes come in. Um, you probably saw on the Mapping Inequality website that they scanned all of the clarifying remarks, which give us a window into why the surveyors designated those areas, the colors or the grades that they did. Um, and as you can see, the, the, these highlighted areas, it's, it's about race, that a particular hazard in the area is race, that there are subversive races or populations there, which is like my favorite sort of wink and a nod way to mention people of color, it's just so ridiculous. Um, and that these populations are subversive and that they're creeping into these neighborhoods. Um, this one is actually one of my favorite examples. It's from Richmond, Virginia, a neighborhood that had been uh, graded as C, or yellow line, which basically means maybe you can get a mortgage, but the rates are gonna be so bad, like don't bother. Um, and the clarifying remark is respectable people, but homes are too near the Negro area D2. 
that means that proximity to blackness was enough to remove your ability to have access to that federally backed debt. That means that that proximity to blackness was enough to lower the property values in your neighborhood as per the understanding of the federal government. And that's, that's a pretty big deal. So we're, we're pretty sure that it's about race. But if we forget about race for a second and we look at the way that the communities are described and credit to Dr. Jeremy Hoffman, I um, pinched this from him. Uh, if you do a word cloud from the clarifying remarks about just the landscape, when you talk about A or B, that's green and blue lines neighborhoods, you see a, a kind of pleasant language, wooded and rolling and shrubbery and, and, and trees and all this sort of stuff. What happens when you look at the C and D clarifying remarks? Well, we see a, a lot of stuff that we probably wouldn't want to live near today. Sewers, manufacturing, odors, hot. So, so these designations um, show that these neighborhoods were not particularly great places to live. Again, I want to emphasize redlining did not cause uh, segregation, but it codified it. And I just want to do like a quick shout out um, based on age here. So I'm an elder millennial. I'm 34, and that means that my parents' generation would have been the first one to have uh, related to race uh, unencumbered access to federally backed mortgages. And when you think about long-term intergenerational wealth, that's not a long time. Like most elder millennials, parents are still alive. Most of them are. Um, and they have access to that. But think about how different that is uh, as compared to someone whose grandparents or great grandparents had access to that intergenerational wealth building tool. So the next slide that I show you is uh, going to show you is one of my favorites. Um, and it is it, it's a gif uh, that of Elizabeth, New Jersey. Elizabeth is a city that is just south of New York City. It's on the coast. And I'm going to show you a digitized redlining map that's overlaid on top of Elizabeth. Um, and just as a quick reminder, a you got that federally backed mortgage, white or our definition of white at the time, because we know that changes. Good housing stock, you got that federally backed mortgage. B, immigrants, black and brown, you're not getting nothing. And I want you to find any green polygon. It doesn't matter where it is, just keep your eye on any green polygon. So this green that you're gonna see underneath, this is tree canopy cover as of 2016. This is impervious pavement as of 2016. So think like parking lots and driveways. And then this is relative heat with red being the hottest. Now find any red polygon, doesn't matter where it is and keep your eye on it. Tree canopy cover, impervious pavement, so driveways, parking lots. You can also use this as a proxy for flooding. Um, and then relative heat with red being the hottest. You might notice some sort of a relationship, but in case the eye test is not working for you and it really shouldn't in maps. Um, this is kind of the punchline in the cities that we work in as you go from A to D those green lines to red line neighborhoods that red bar which is the land surface temperature goes up. That gray bar which is the impervious surface so parking lots driveways, you can also use that as a proxy for flooding because like if it rains, where's the water going to go in an asphalt parking lot um, it goes from A to D it increases and this is my least favorite part that as you go from A to D that green bar the tree canopy cover precipitously declines um, and uh, Dr. Jeremy Hoffman and Vivek Shandas, who's actually at PSU, did this really groundbreaking study about two, three years ago where they found that if you take the average of the land surface temperature of all of the formerly redlined cities, redlined neighborhoods are on average 4.5 degrees hotter than their green line counterparts. So that can be as extreme as 20 degrees Fahrenheit. And I really want to emphasize that 20 degrees Fahrenheit number. That's the difference between turning on your air conditioner and not. That's the difference between having a $200 cooling bill at the end of July and a $300 one that your family cannot afford on their fixed income. That's the difference between going for an afternoon walk with your family and ending up in the hospital for heat stroke. This is a number, but it has real consequences on the way that humans interact with their families, with their communities and with their finances, it's a big deal. And you might say, well, Kate, our neighborhoods look really different. Neighborhoods are gentrifying, people move, they follow opportunity. How do we know that this um, redlining that impacted a certain group of people in the past is still impacting the same types of people today. Well, today about 75% of those neighborhoods that were graded D, so redlined in the 1930s, they're still low to moderate income neighborhoods. About two thirds of them are majority minority. So as James Baldwin says, the past is not past. At this point, if you've studied anything related to race in America, you're probably disappointed, but not terribly surprised by what I've had to say to you. But you might have another question. You might say, Kate, my community wasn't redlined. Maybe it didn't exist at the time. Maybe it was you know, under 100,000 people. I don't think this applies to me. Well, I'm gonna give you a couple examples. 
some of you might be familiar with Lawrence, Massachusetts. It's a planned mill town that's about an hour on the commuter rail north of Boston. Um, duck cloth and canvas and shoes were produced there predominantly, and it had a pretty mixed population um, that wasn't terribly heavily segregated. Lawrence was actually never redlined. But the neighborhoods, the suburban communities and some of the cities that were north of Lawrence were, which meant that there were all of a sudden places in Massachusetts that had access to federally backed mortgages that were allowed to spread out this big chunk of debt over a really long period of time, which makes it a little bit more affordable. And I want you to see what happens here. So Lawrence is in the second set center and then Methuen, which is in the north, north Andover. This is tree canopy cover, impervious pavement, uh, relative heat with red being the hottest. And then there's also poverty. And these are all of 2016 to 2018. So even though Lawrence itself wasn't redlined, there was white flight because there is opportunity for a certain class and a certain racial caste of residents from Lawrence to go out into the suburbs, take advantage of uh, increasingly middle-class jobs and suburban office parks, and then take advantage of those federally backed mortgages and move to the places where white people were allowed to move. Um, I also like this example. Some of you might be familiar with Richmond, California, which is in the Bay Area. Um, it's a neighborhood, it's, it's, a, it's a community that has um, an oil refinery on the coast and was also a major shipyard in, uh, during the World War II period. And during World War II, there was a lot of labor that was needed at the shipyards. So tons of African-American Blacks, mostly from the South, some from the Middle West, were migrating to Richmond for those well-paying manufacturing jobs in the shipyards. My gosh, the federal government all of a sudden has a crisis on its hands. There's a ton of workers. Those workers are needed to do these jobs, but there's no housing. So the federal government starts passing out contracts for the development of private and public housing. But here's the catch. They don't want black people to stay. So they designate certain areas for black homes, certain areas for, for uh, white homes, but they require in the contracts that the homes built for black residents be built out of worse material. We're talking about instead of getting your asphalt roof, you're getting corrugated tin. Um, and they placed the black residents in this area called the Black Crescent. Um, and the most densely populated neighborhood had the refinery on one side, has a uh, petrochemical rail yard on one side and another petrochemical rail yard on the other side. So it creates this area called the Iron Triangle. What you see overlaid on top of the Iron Triangle, which is right in the center of this picture, are the asthma rates in Richmond, California. So even though this neighborhood was never redlined, even though the, sorry, the city was never redlined, there is still a federal paper trail of how their intervention segregated and forced certain groups of people to live in certain places. Um, and if you overlay uh, asthma with redlining maps, you're gonna be disappointed because it's uh, the redlined neighborhoods that have the worst asthma rates. You can do the same thing with COVID uh, illness rates and death rates. You can do the same thing with maternal mortality. You can do the same thing with infant mortality. Pretty much any metric that you would be disappointed and ashamed of having your country have that relationship is probably related to uh, redlining. The one exception to that is actually cancer rates. Cancer is something you need to age into. Older people tend to get cancer, younger people don't. People who live in these formerly redlined neighborhoods tend to not live long enough to develop cancer. So that's the one exception that you see to that rule. At this point, you probably feel like this. You're like, cool, I didn't realize from the title that you were just gonna bum me out for 90 minutes. You've laid a dirty, dirty trap. Um, and you might also be thinking, but I think I have the solution. I saw those maps and what we really gotta do is plant things. And the answer is like, well, kinda. This is outside of my home in Somerville, Massachusetts. It's a formerly yellow line neighborhood that never had trees on our street uh, until about three years ago. And this tree is going to be like, okay, in, in about 10, 15 years. But right now it casts a shadow that's about the size and shape of a pizza box, which is not particularly helpful for reducing the ambient air temperature or scrubbing the air quality from the diesel train in the distance when it runs by. Additionally, in a lot of these red line neighborhoods, the infrastructure restrains some of the green infrastructure. You might notice those, uh, those power lines that means that the trees are only allowed to be a certain height before they're cut down by the utility company and the city actually won't plant trees that grow any taller. So we're really limited by some of the infrastructure that's existed long before many of the residents were there. So you shouldn't really, be, you should, but I just wanna back up. Wait, yes, you should plant trees, please do that. Please encourage your city to vote for whatever referendum makes it happen, please do. But what you really should be doing, and this is the part where we're gonna to get to the hope is you should be asking why has this not already been done? If these redlining maps happened in 1933, if the Civil Rights Act outlawed the practice, just legally and on paper, of redlining, why is it that these harms haven't been fixed yet? Why do our cities look the way that they do? Who makes the rules about the city and who has a right to the city? 
these p big pieces of infrastructure that we've installed over the last hundred years, they're really hard to move and they're really hard to deal with. And we need to understand and appreciate why it is that certain folks are living near these pieces of infrastructure that are making them sick, that are making them more vulnerable. Um, and that's a lot of what we do at Groundwork USA is we're organizing residents for systems change. The system is working beautifully. It's working perfectly as it was designed to disadvantage a certain group of folks over another group of folks. And we're really interested in changing and tweaking that system. The work that we do in our Climate Safe Neighborhoods Partnership is to organize residents and help them to understand why their neighborhoods look the way that they do. Once you understand that the way your community looks wasn't an accident, you understand that it's also not gonna change by accident and you can start to build a vision for the future. Residents then prioritize the mitigation measures that they would like to see in their neighborhoods. And then we build their capacity to intervene in policy and planning systems so that they can self advocate for a more equitable distribution of resources. And you probably noticed that in this presentation, I lean a lot on maps. We do that a lot in our organizing work because people respond to the visualization of unfairness in a really powerful way. Why is it that the Northern part of Richmond, Virginia where most black community members live is so hot, so much hotter than the other neighborhoods. Why is it that the northern part of Elizabeth, New Jersey, which has a lot of Hispanic residents, how come it doesn't have any tree canopy cover? It really forces you to reckon with why does our neighborhood look the way that it does, and that helps create a path forward. I'm gonna give you two quick examples before I wrap this up and start to move towards what you can do in your community about the ways that we've uh, intervened. So in Denver, I think I heard that there's a couple of folks uh, here who are from Denver, who do live in Denver. Uh, Denver's passed a couple of ballot measures which create steady streams of funding for green infrastructure and for parks and capital backlog, but they haven't been terribly great or transparent about deciding where that money goes. And there was a big scandal recently where a lot of this uh, parks money went to the downtown area so that they can make it more uh, beautiful to tourists, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we actually had residents poking uh, around um, in the maps. And one of the neighborhoods we're working in is called Globeville. It's in the northern part of Denver and the entire neighborhood is a super fun site. It's home to a former lead smelting plant. It's got a lot of the environmental justice issues that you expect of these formerly red line neighborhoods. And it was actually a resident who was poking around and said, gosh, our neighborhood has 1% tree canopy cover. But if you hop on a bus and take it across the river to a formerly green line neighborhood, you see tree canopy cover that um, starts at 24% and can go as high as 65%. Think about the difference in air quality, difference in property values and beauty. Think about the difference in temperature. So residents came up with a really concrete ask. We want 10,000 trees planted in 10 years and a say in funding distribution. Over the past few years, we've been holding this intervention academy to help build the capacity of residents to understand how does your budget system work? What's your city councilor for? Who pulls the lever of control? Who's in charge of maintaining the system as it is right now? And something that I'm super excited about is that the um, some of these women who are on the screen, there are about 10 folks who are in this last year of our intervention academy. Um, and four of those 10 folks are now on the board that makes decisions about how that uh, ballot to a funding is going to be distributed. So lots of money that wasn't going to uh, head to Globeville, I think is going to be heading to Globeville in the next few years. Um, the final example that I'll use is in Richmond, Virginia, where they recently went through their master planning process. And we did a lot of citizen science work here, working with youth in the community to go outside, take those ambient air temperature um, and those land surface temperature and air quality measurements and go to door to door with residents to have conversations with them about about how they're experiencing the climate crisis. Um, and I don't know if you, I, I don't know if, I think some of the people on this call are old enough to remember this, but I, 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 transparencies, overhead transparencies, maybe your math teacher would like plop it on the overhead and be like, we're gonna do algebra. Um, we actually found that printing out the maps on these transparencies was a great way to take the maps on the go. Uh, so we would give folks a map of their neighborhood, then a map of transparency of tree canopy cover, a redlining map, and, and use that to jog the conversation. And so it's actually uh, the youth that you see in this picture that are going door to door with these transparencies to talk to folks and to encourage them to engage in this master planning process. Um, and uh, through doing demonstration projects to help cool and dry the neighborhood, we're able to pull people in, have additional conversations with them and get them to show up and intervene. And something that I'm super thrilled about is residents were able to get language, binding funded language into their Richmond master plan um, that prioritizes formerly redlined neighborhoods for the uh, installation of green infrastructure over the next 10 years. So there's a lot of people power here. You might be saying, okay, cool. So that's what you do for your paid work. I've got a different job. I don't have all this time. What can I do in my community to make things right? Well, the first thing you need to do is get into a Zen headspace about the fact that there is no 100% solution. There is no panacea that's going to fix this. The best that we can do is cobble together the best 1% solutions that we can 
and have it add up to a tipping point towards equity. The four questions that you should be centering yourself around are who are my people? And by my people, I mean, who are the people that are being impacted by the climate crisis? Who are the people that are getting flooded out? And we tend to think of floods as these like dramatic events that wash people's cars away. But I also want you to think about that insidious flooding that leaks into your basement and ruins your stuff, that gets into your drywall and makes it so that your kid can't breathe. Also think about what is the change they need. And the only way that you're gonna figure that out is by talking to people and having conversations with them about what the change they need is. Um, and then asking these two other questions, why has that change not yet come and who makes the final decision about that change? Um, and from those two, sorry, from those four questions, there are two objectives that you should have going into this work. The first is we need to make this future survivable for you, your community, and for other people. And there are short-term mitigation measures that you can do uh, or encourage to happen in your neighborhood. Um, these are things like depaving parties. I live in Somerville where like everybody has paved over their backyard for parking. Like Bostonians are really weird about parking. It is just the way that they are. Um, but we have these depaving parties that happen where a group of community members come together, break up the pavement and landscape the backyard for the homeowner um, or for the renters who are there to give them green space and allow the water to have somewhere to go. Um, even installing something really simple like a downspout planter uh, in your neighborhood can help to keep some of that extra water out and away from people's homes. Maybe you've got an extra air conditioner, high efficiency air conditioner that's sitting in your basement. Get that into the hands of someone who needs it so that they can help cool themselves um, and advocate for these 1% uh, green infrastructure solutions. Your second objective is, this is the really important one, is you really need to fuck up the system. I mentioned earlier that the system is working beautifully. It is working just as it was designed and intended to. Um, and that's gonna disadvantage a really particular group of folks. So how do you do systems change? Cause that's kind of weird. Uh, the first piece is kind of what you're doing right now. Dig into your local history. Why does your neighborhood look the way that it does? If your neighborhood doesn't look the way that it does by accident. It's not gonna change by accident. The other piece is to name who isn't in the room. So when you go to uh, community meetings, when you go to uh, hearings, at your local government level, which I know you all do. And if you don't, you should start doing it. So many of them are on Zoom now, you find the time. It's really important to name who isn't in the room and point to the voices who are being left out. Um, and then the final piece is to make sure that you're pushing to fund um, and maintain green infrastructure that prioritizes vulnerable areas. And I put a little asterisk next to vulnerable areas because by vulnerable, I mean areas that are experiencing heat and wet and poor air quality but the people there don't have the adaptive capacity, the funding, the resources, the ear of local government to deal with that. Um, something that you folks might be asking is, hey, a lot of these communities have gentrified. Uh, some really interesting research into these neighborhoods that were formerly redlined, but now have higher income populations uh, show that people who are gentrifiers don't actually tend to invest a lot of money into improving the infrastructure of the neighborhood because they have enough money to cool their own condo. They're not gonna be pushing for a lot of trees or for cooling measures in their neighborhood. So find those neighborhoods that are vulnerable and, and um, advocate for those messages. I think we're gonna go into a question and answer session now, but thanks for listening to me talk for like 30 minutes about hot, wet American racism. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. I love talking about this stuff. I encourage you to check out our website and after this conversation, I'll set it to send me an email because I'd love to chat more with you. So thanks everybody. Thank you so much, Kate. I, that, that presentation was awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. So yeah. Anybody got some questions? Or things to say too. Yeah. Not that way. Amy, I'm actually going to allow, um, I'm going to unmute so that people can, if you'd like to. I see Mark Aronson. Uh, yep, thanks for raising your hand. And if anyone else wants to either put in the chat that you have a question, I can unmute you. Mark, you have to unmute yourself. Go ahead. Hey, that was terrific. Um, I live in New Haven, Connecticut, where we're trying to remediate a lot of these issues. We have urban resources initiative going around every summer planting trees with city kids. Um, I have a question about um, the aesthetic of trees. And do you run into communities that just don't like them? Um, I've lived in a community in, in, in Philadelphia where they hated trees and mm -hmm. a friend of mine planted a tree in her yard and all the neighbors complained. I live in a in a building uh, in New Haven. I, I rent, and um, we used to have beautiful trees in our courtyard, and mm. and they were cut down because they're a pain in the ass. Yep. And then the lawn. Why? What? What can we do to discourage people from uh, 
Is the lawn beneficial or not beneficial? Isn't it an environmental catastrophe maintaining a green lawn? Yeah, a couple of questions in there. Thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, we find all the time that residents really don't want trees there. There's two reasons they don't. The first one is the maintenance of it. My gosh, I have to worry about where the roots go. You're telling me that I need to rake some leaves. What happens if it falls into the roof of my house? And there's a lot of concerns that people have. Uh, generally, the lifespan of an urban tree is about six years. So those concerns are actually not that unfounded. It's, it's something that can be expensive. And everybody who's on the line, if your current line of work is not working for you, like get into the arborist game because they get paid real well. Um, and it can be really expensive to hire an arborist to come and cut that dead branch off before it falls into your neighbor's property and causes a problem. The other reason, and this is a lot more common, is that we run into folks who are concerned about the gentrification and displacement impact. If there are trees coming in our neighborhood, like what's next? Is it going to be like husky puppies and steakhouses? Like what? Like what's on the tail of, of these trees? And so a big piece of what we, and I'm not going to say that anybody at Groundwork has cracked the nut on gentrification or what's called green gentrification when you get rid of the contaminated land, dredge the stinky river, you know, all of a sudden the condos go up and people get pushed out. We have not cracked the nut. We're working on it, uh, but, but we don't have the solution. Uh, but we found that a big piece of it is, is having one-on-one -on -one conversations and communities, with, uh, conversations with people to convince them to get these trees planted on their properties. Um, I used to work for the Division of Public Housing uh, for the Common wealth of Massachusetts. And um, the maintenance staff cut down a lot of mature trees near the housing authority because they were sick and tired of the maintenance. They didn't want to rake the leaves. They didn't want to pay the arborist. The next time there was a major rainstorm, they had eight inches of water that flooded into the basement or garden apartment units. The cost to replace some of those goods, the cost to the residents there was much higher than what the maintenance cost would have been. So part of what we talked to when we talk to residents is to help talk to them about the benefits uh, of these trees on reducing moisture, uh, on helping to reduce their heating and their cooling bills. But it's a really arduous process that happens to ha that has to happen one by one. If you just pop the trees up or really any green infrastructure intervention, uh, people tend to be really annoyed by it, right? Nothing about us without us also applies to the built environment outside of people's homes. So we do a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations. Uh, we tend to be the urban forester in the cities that we work in. So we're used to you know, wearing through the soles of our shoes, door knocking and talking with folks. Um, but there's, there's a lot of that risk. So residents tend to be leaning, a trend I'm noticing is residents uh, tend to be leaning towards the strategy of just green enough. Let's add some trees to help lower the ambient air temperature, but like, let's not overdo it so that people are trying to put condos where we are. Do I think that's gonna stop the condos? No, I don't. But the residents, that's, that's the way that a lot of them are viewing that. Um, and as for the lawns, yeah, get rid of your lawn. Why would you have a lawn when you can grow cherry tomatoes there? Why would you have a lawn when you can when you can do something else that's kind of fun there? So yeah, get rid of your green lawn. That's like so 15th century, like get out of here. <laughs> uh, Vasili's had uh, their hand up, his hand up for a little while. So- uh, Hey, Vasili. Yeah. Hi. 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 Great talk, that was a great talk to you. Thank um, you. I, I have a question that, I don't know if it doesn't make any sense so there's nothing to, to say we can just okay. pass on it but yeah. looking throughout the maps i saw that some of the red lined areas were in mm -hmm. the center of the city mm. and sometimes the green line areas were in the center of the city and red line areas were outside like on yep. the outskirts yep um and sometimes you know they're really you know quite divided and sometimes like you will have a red lined area next to you know mm -hmm. yellow or green and then a red line on the other side again yeah like is there anything interesting to say about um yeah. you know, does that matter is that because of geography or topography yeah. or industry or yeah. because of just the racism <laughs> you named all of you named it's all of the above one of the things that we usually do first is to take a look at the topography of an area um, i think cincinnati is really interesting that image that i opened up with is in an area called the basin district and you can see how sharply divided it is between the area with the tree canopy cover and then the area that is starting to move into a little bit more industry um, one of the reasons for that is that there's a rail yard that passes through there so it's not super pleasant to live near a rail yard i currently live near a, a commuter rail so i know that that's the case um, and then the other pieces that the Ohio River tends to flood into that area. And, and you might have noticed that there was like a slight gradient in the help. So looking at where industry is located is a big one. Um, looking where bodies of water are located, river and sorry, riverfront and waterfront properties generally are super popular right now. But like rewind 30 or 40 years ago, cities were still dumping, Boston's a great example, dumping a lot of uh, sewage into those areas. So waterfront areas that tended to flood or that tended to carry waste products were not super great to live near. Um, so look at industry, look at topography. Rich people live on hills. 
overwhelmingly. Poor people live in valleys or uh, sometimes they're, they're called quote unquote black bottoms uh, where the water um, either will come down from the surrounding hillsides or will raise up either from the ground or, or spill over from a river. So you, you, you hit on all of them, it's, it's, it's all of the above. But when we're evaluating the redlining maps, we tend to also look at topography at the same time. Uh, thank you. Um, so we've had a few ch questions come into the chat bar. We've gotten some more folks getting their questions out there. So okay. I'm going to ask that um, people who have their hands raised put their question in the chat bar so I can try to do things in, in the order. Um, so we had a question from Rachel Fredericks, class of 04. Thanks so much for sharing your expertise with all of us, Kate. Great stuff. I know that solar panels can only be installed on certain roofs, but um, are there any limitations on which roofs are good candidates for the white painting technique? So there's a lot of really fussy stuff to say about white roofs. I'm glad you brought that up because it's, it's the jury's still a little bit out. Um, when you have apartment buildings that are over a certain number of stories, somewhere in the four to five story and above range, the white roofs can be really helpful in reducing the ambient air temperatures, especially building size. Um, the lower the buildings are, the more you probably don't want to do it. There's a, a recent study that came out in 2019. Um, I don't know if you folks followed, like Los Angeles painted a lot of their roadways white as a climate mitigation like pilot. Um, and a study that came out of that showed that when you have uh, that white roof down at the pedestrian level or at lower levels of, of elevation, um, it, it, tends, it, it causes a uh, sort of like a chemical reaction to have the sunlight reflected at that low of a level that creates more ozone. So you start to see higher asthma rates. So that there was this movement maybe about five years ago that was saying, hey, we need to make everything really light colored. Um, and, and there's actually a limit to that. We don't want to put those like really highly reflective materials down in parking lots or around people's homes. One, it's kind of blinding and is not super comfortable to have that really bright um, uh, uh, reflection back into your face. And then the other pieces, it tends to reduce uh, reduce air quality. So I don't know anything about sort of like this, the slope or um, angle of roofs in the way that you would need to have that for, for solar installations, but the height seems to matter quite a bit. Uh, so, so keep it, you know, if you're gonna paint it, which still they say that it helps with cooling the building, um, keep it high. Great. Uh, so Jeff Wright um, is asking in the chat bar, there are a lot of remediation efforts that sound workable and helpful. Is there a scale or ranking of best efforts that might be helpful? Also, what role do community gardens play in this change? Yeah, it, the, the remedi remediation efforts are going to be so place-based that it's hard to generalize. Uh, we do work from, one of the reasons why we chose the nine cities that we did, and that's everywhere from San Diego to Denver to Richmond, Virginia to Pawtucket, Rhode Island, is we wanted to see uh, how these mitigation measures and how these uh, systems change interventions played out in places with different experiences of the climate crisis. Richmond, Virginia is flooding all of the time. It is just underwater in the summer, tons of really bad flooding, um, not really great sewage infrastructure in some of the formerly red line neighborhoods. Uh, out in, in San Diego, it's actually dry most of the time until you get the flash flooding from the Choyas Creek that steals patio furniture off of people's backyards and takes their cars away. Um, so so the, the remediation efforts are, um, are, are, are sort of challenging. Um, I'd say that across the board, uh, trees that can withstand the change in temperature, we talk a lot about native trees, which is important. We want to protect those pollinators, but we also need to be looking to a future that's hotter and wetter. We don't exactly know how much hotter. We don't exactly know how much wetter, but we need to look for uh, green infrastructure solutions that are going to weather some degree of change. Um, but generally, instead of uh, saying the remediation efforts, we can say really heavily what we want to avoid, which are large swaths of asphalt. Um, bad for a couple of reasons. One, that water doesn't have anywhere to go. Two, it absorbs that sunlight and radiates it out. That's a, a big driver of the urban heat island effect. And then the third piece, which we actually don't think about, is like that stuff's actually not very good to be around human beings. And if you ever want to do something with the with the parcel underneath, when you remove that asphalt, that, that land is contaminated, needs to be remediated pretty heavily. So there's not a really great ranking of those interventions and mitigation measures that would apply from you know Phoenix to Philadelphia. Uh, but we can generally say, you know, hey, no thanks on the pavement yes to trees that can withstand the, the hotter uh, and wetter weather that we're, we're seeing nationally and the more extreme weather that we're seeing. Thank you. Uh, so uh, Eric uh, Pasetsky, uh, class of 88, asks um, or says, uh, there are a lot of remediation efforts that sound workable and helpful. Is there a scale ranking of best efforts that might be helpful? It looks like that's a repeat. 
Oh, sorry. Let me look down here in the chat bar. Okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, I'm taking a course in designing food forests. There are many fruit trees and plants that can be planted around them to cause improvement in the soil. Sweet potato peanuts. There are some beautiful and productive food forest demonstration products that are self-sustaining food producing areas. Have you worked with any? Um, so I haven't worked with anything related to that, but I'm so happy that you're um, uh, peeking into it. A lot of the work that I do outside of the climate work is actually on brownfield remediation and, and helping communities to take contaminated lands and turn them into community assets. And that is one area where we do work with, um, with, with bioremediation to help draw some of the contaminants out of the soil. It's a very slow process, so that is not like the primary way to make an unusable piece of land usable, but it's something that can help with relatively light um, amounts of, of contamination uh, in the soil. So I haven't worked in that space and haven't worked on it related to climate mitigation, but if you run across any cool stuff that you think I should look at, please send it my way. Uh, Kellen asks, is there a database that collects the deficiencies in specific neighborhoods, like the websites that allow citizens to report potholes? Also, what are your favorite ideas to reduce the Matthew effect overall? Um, so in turn, there's a lot of different um, web portals where you can view maps. Some of them are city specific. Um, some of them like the Park Serve SERV database. Um, I can tell you where the different green spaces, um, where different green spaces are and can give you a sense of where how the tree canopy cover is distributed. The other thing that's super nice and this is one of the things that is just like awesome about living in the United States is we have pretty amazing access to data. If you go to Canada, if you go to other countries, they don't have as much public data that's available, but we spend a lot of tax dollars on things like putting Landsat, you know, six through eight into the sky, which will do things like covering tree canopy cover, showing us which areas are hotter, which areas are wetter. Um, and all of that is, is information that is freely available. You do have to have some familiarity with like ArcGIS or with QGIS, which is the open source version of ArcGIS, um, which is a little bit of a barrier. And also maps are not super useful to people on their own. You usually need to contextualize them um, or, or uh, have, some, have some history attached uh, to them. So you can check out the ParkServe database if you're curious about um, things like land surface temperature, tree canopy distribution. But a lot of cities also have them at the local level. Um, I know Philadelphia has a really great mapping portal. Um, MAPC, which services the eastern part of Massachusetts, um, has a portal where you can look at um, how, 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 these, how these things are distributed, how um, tree canopy cover, um, flood risk, things like that are distributed. The other thing is that um, it's a little bit hard to tell where floods are. The way that this data is collected is that there's just a bunch of satellites that are going around the earth and it's kind of easy for them to capture things like is there a tree here because every time it passes by that tree is probably still going to be there capturing things like floods which can happen really quickly in san diego those flash flooding events can just be an hour long and then it's over um or the uh, sewers backing up in rhode island those things are a little bit harder harder to capture and the data is actually a little trickier to clean up so there's not really great and consistent data on on flood stuff but you can find um data related to the other pieces. So thanks for that. Lorna Seitz uh, asks, do you have any observations about which systems change interventions work best in which circumstances or locations? Yeah, I, I think the systems change interventions that work best are the ones that you can get community members to, to, to self-generate because you have a lot of community momentum. Uh, these organizing efforts take a really long time and they can be incredibly disappointing. Um, for as many successes as I can put up on the screen and each one of our trusts has had a really great success, we've suffered a lot of failures along the way and that's just what happens in, in, in community organizing. Um, but generally the, the question that we need to think about is um, the way that our systems are designed is that they're intentionally designed to be obscure. Not everybody on this call knows whether or not they have a strong or weak mayor. Not everybody on this call knows like all of the alder, alder people or city councilors um, or knows exactly what their role are. Not everybody can name how a budget works. Um, so a really big piece of uh, engaging in that systems change is figuring out who has the power so residents can come together and create power with each other to then create power over that system and redirect it. And, and what we really should be looking for is uh, a change in our systems to prioritize authentic shared leadership and decision-making with residents. Residents need to be in the driver's seat in making decisions about their community, but really frequently they're entirely left out of the car 
So we find that intervening in things like master planning processes can be really helpful because there's usually a funding source that's attached to it. You can have like declarations all the live long day. You can have unfunded, Massachusetts loves its unfunded mandate. We love it out here. Um, and it's not gonna be helpful to folks unless there's a funding stream. So we need to understand where that level, level of power is. It's usually an individual that makes a decision and there usually is an individual that releases the funding. So, so identifying and pushing against those two levers is usually what, what makes it happen, but it, it varies so much from, from city to city. But the question you need to ask is why hasn't this change happened yet? And whose decision is it to make that change happen? That's gonna point you in the direction of the system that you need to change. And it's most important um, at the local level to identify what system is bothering your specific people. Uh, Dustin Bowers of uh, 09 asks, uh, this is just below the neighborhood infrastructure level, but how much effort do you think should be put towards upgrading something like the insulation of buildings? Yeah, I love when people pull me back to reality with that specific question, because the work that I do is all on climate mitigation, which assumes that we are a certain degree of fucked. There is a certain amount of climate crisis that is locked in. Uh, we don't know like where on the apocalyptic scale it's going to be. We, we have a sense that like we can still kind of turn the ship a little bit, but we're locked into a certain degree of this. And I often forget about the fact that we are still releasing emissions and it can get so much worse. So if there are stretch codes that are being considered in your community, like fight like hell for it. Um, if you have community members that are pushing to get rid of gas hookups in favor of electric, like push like hell for it. Because doing things like um, upgrading the envelope of buildings to increase their insulation is tremendous. I live in a, a three unit um, condo and our neighbors got together when, when um, my partner and I just moved into this place um, and decided to have rigid foam insulation put in. Um, didn't cost that much more than regular foam, but the energy loss that we have is significantly reduced. The, the people who were um, here before uh, were spending about $250 on the uh, gas heat in um, the building like per month and we pay about $60. So the payback period is gonna be about three years for installing that rigid foam insulation where, where we live. Um, and uh, think about that reduced energy use. Think about the reduced amount of methane that's being put in. Um, gas leaks are a tremendous problem. You guys saw a couple of photos in my presentation um, right off of where I live. There's a, a pretty heavy gas and substantial gas leak um, that's leaking out gas and killing all of the trees in our neighborhood for, for about a half mile radius from, from the gas leak. Um, that's, that, that's a really big deal. So yeah, absolutely focus on that because it could still get worse. It could still get worse. A lot of the stuff that I focus on is how do we survive what we're locked into right now, but we need a lot of folks like you working on how to keep this from really going off the rails. It's a bummer. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from Jaboit at hotmail.com. How do you balance the cost and time required for public involvement with their adverse impact on housing costs? Oh, this is my favorite. The landed class is out of control. We're just going to start there. I say that as someone who does like own my condo, the bank owns it. I rent from the bank right now is, is the situation, but um, it, it's, it's really, it's really, really hard that they're um, the public the public involvement in these mitigation, I guess like there's there's two different ways to look at it. There's the time that you spend focusing on these particular mitigation issues as compared to other social ills that are a huge problem. So there, there's like that sort of a cost. Um, and then there's also the cost, the decision to spend um, upgrading public infrastructure so that we reduce greenhouse gas emissions and we protect folks uh, versus the impact that it might have in that green gentrification way. And it's, it's really hard to balance. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure sort of which direction you were asking your question in, but uh, it's, it's just, it's, it's something that's really hard to balance. We haven't cracked the nut on, on how to do that, on how to do that well yet. It, it does, it does we, we do find that in some areas it does have an adverse effect on housing costs and that's a really big deal. And it's tough, you have neighborhoods that are broken up, people have to scatter. It's highly traumatic for community members to get displaced um, from, from their communities. But then at the same time, we need to get our, our stuff together around making sure that these residents have clean air to breathe. So it's, it's, it's something that's really hard. We tend to also partner with um, housing advocacy groups, support your local community land trust, decommodify that land that is on the hierarchy of needs. We shouldn't be pricing people um, out of their neighborhoods and pushing them into homelessness. I wasn't totally sure which way your question, so feel free to ask your question again if I didn't answer it, but I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, Kellen asks, what do you think about adding estimates of costs for specific remedies to the maps that contain information about the problems like flooding and the estimates of the continuation of the problem? 
That's a fun one. Yeah, that would be sort of that would be a fun next step. And I think that one of the things to pay attention to is whether or not you're um, trying to target intervention at the individual level, so the people who own that property, or whether or not you're trying to target intervention at the level of the city. Um, making these changes to city infrastructure um, are really, really challenging. Um, but also having the city be responsible for the harm that that core infrastructure causes is also really challenging. Generally, they can they can get away with it. Something that we've worked on in the Troyes Creek watershed neighborhood is um, residents who had been forced to live in that community. It was a red line community. Um, it was a highly segregated space that's predominantly um, a great diaspora migration, uh, African American black. Uh, who live in this Radio Canyon um, area have been their homes have been flooded for, for generation for generations at this point. Um, and the city has not taken responsibility for improving the infrastructure of the Troyes Creek watershed and just saying, hey, you guys are the ones who have your houses near this uh, area that flash floods like best of luck. Um, through our community organizing uh, and partnership, we've been finally able to get the city of San Diego to recognize it as a piece of municipal infrastructure, which means that it's eligible for funding. But then comes the next question, how much is actually going to cost to make these uh, changes. Something you should look into, which is kind of fun, um, this new tool called the Stanford Invest Model, which looks at uses land cover data and satellite data to come up with an estimate of what the type of mitigation measure would need to be to have a certain impact. So for example, if you said, I want to reduce the ambient air temperature by, um, you know, four degrees or something over a 15 year period, um, the, the, the model would be able to show you where you would need to plant these trees or, or make these shade modifications. Um, and it can give you an, an estimate of that, how much that costs. And that's a really super useful tool. And we're actually just starting to do that in Cincinnati. So we just finished it up for flooding. We're working on heat now. Um, so hopefully we'll have that information at the municipal level uh, added, uh, but it's a little bit hard because there's also a lot of stuff underground related to the utilities that's hard to dig into. A lot of cities actually don't have their sewage systems mapped. Like they actually just don't exist. Someone put it down and no one decided to draw it or the drawings got lost. Um, so it can be really hard to get very, very accurate data, especially around flooding. But things like heat are, are a little bit easier to do. And things like the Stanford Invest model are, are helpful in doing that. Um, Mark McLean, class of 70. Uh, what kind of leverage can be generated through the HOA if your neighborhood has one? Hmm. That's a really good question. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I, I'm not super familiar with the HOA structure. I tend to work in cities that um, where there's a high degree of renters. Uh, so, so a lot of it is trying to talk with the people who actually own the property to, to make those uh, climate mitigation um, changes. But I think it depends on whether or not your community is one of the ones that's vulnerable. And this is a really great opportunity to go around and talk to your neighbors and understand what are the problems that you folks are facing. When we were doing our organizing in Pawtucket and um, Central Falls, this was in the before times, before COVID, uh, we would go around and ask folks about how heat and wet were impacting them in their day-to-day -day life. And we heard a lot of stuff like, you know, our utility bills are higher. But this one story always sticks with me of this woman who said, it was in Rhode Island, said, you know, I used to go out and walk my dog on my lunch break, but now the pavement gets so hot the last couple of years in the summer that it burns my dog's paws. And I've had to move our daily walk to earlier in the day to about 10 or 11 in the morning. Um, so, so sort of digging in and finding like, wow, actually the land surface temperature is a huge problem for this particular household. Um, let's focus on mitigation measures. So, so I think having conversations with the sort of association um, about what if you know if your community is the one that is struggling or is suffering from the climate crisis, which it probably is, because all of us are, and having conversations with folks about where that's needed, um, in terms of outward-facing stuff uh, that's that's getting involved with folks who are already doing the work and having conversations with the people who are suffering most. Uh, Stephen says you haven't said much about building density in downtown neighborhoods. Mm. Um, so I, there's not much more to the question, but yeah. do you have anything to say about that? I'm thinking about building density. That's a, it's, a hard, it's a hard one to balance. Um, I live in Somerville, which is one of the densest cities in, in Massachusetts. It has the least, second least amount of green space in Massachusetts. Um, and it also has some of the highest housing costs in Massachusetts. Um, so, so building density is one that's a little bit tricky for a couple of reasons. Um, one, uh, if you have really dense spaces, you can also potentially not have access to a lot of green spaces. We saw during this uh, pandemic that green spaces are super, super important for, for weathering crises. They're also really important for reducing ambient air temperature. They're also really important for capturing flood water and they just don't really exi exist in some spaces. Um, but then there's also this other side of, hey, 
people need somewhere to live. The jobs happen to be in the city. So it's, it's something that's, that's really, I don't know if you have a more specific question than that, but it's a, it's a hard one. Generally I'm pro like let's build housing to get folks housed because people deserve to sleep inside. Um, but th at the same time, recognize that it's something that does contribute to the urban heat island effect. But the reality is that that's the way the, de the demographics are moving. The jobs are still in cities. People are still moving to cities. Should we be planning a retreat? Should we be planning, you know, spreading ourselves out? Arguably, yes, especially from coastal areas. Hey, you folks that live in New York, don't know how long that's viable. Um, you might be thinking about other options at this point for the for the future. Um, but but yeah, it's, it's hard. The jobs are where they are. People's communities and relationships are where they are. But we need to carve out um, carve out spaces that that uh, serve uh, what folks actually need to keep them safe in the climate crisis and survive. Survival is like is actually like survival is actually where we are right now. We're at, we're at a survival space. Uh, Julia Meltzer, class of two thousand two, asks, "How do you see the role of planned retreat and buyouts? I know they can tend to favor homeowners and folks with more resources, but what about EJ neighborhoods facing displacement?" This is, this is a hard one. I wish I had some super smart informed opinions, but I haven't spent too much time digging into it, so I'm not going to pull stuff out of my nose on it. Um, but there's lots of really great research. Um, I, a friend of mine, Julie Curdy, did a really great, it was some really great research on um, planned retreat in Cranston, Rhode Island, which is a coastal community that has a mix of very high income residents and very, very low income residents. And you do sort of see that, that the people who have the higher uh, income that tend to have the higher political power are the folks who are able to get more money from their buyouts and, and, and find it a little bit easier to relocate. It's traumatic regardless of whether you're a wealthy individual or a um, lower income individual. It's, it's a really, really traumatic experience, but that's something that we should be thinking about at this point. Um, we tend to think about resilience in our country as bouncing back to the way things are before. I think we all kind of feel that energy related to the COVID crisis that like, you know, re resilient, let everybody go back to the way that things were before, but we need to be um, thinking a little bit differently. We need to not think about bouncing back um, and communities being resilient if they can bounce back. We should be thinking about resilience through the lens of how do we avoid that harm from happening in the first place and sort of a preventative approach. And part of that means we really should be looking at planned retreat, not just from coastal areas, but from areas that have a really high degree of wildfires as well. Um, and I'm not talking about like, you know, emptying out the entire city of Portland because it got super smoky, um, but we do need to think about what areas are dangerous and how much uh, federal and taxpayer funding we want to put into supporting people who are living in, in, in communities that are really dangerous and, and can we help and support them to build neighborhoods and places where they're going to be physically safe, they're going to survive, and that the cost is going to be lower for, for everybody to, to, to shoulder. Uh, Jeb Boyd, class of 1988, asks, wait, are you advocating sprawl over living in towns where pe uh, can, people can walk, bike, and take transit? There's extensive research that dense urban building has lower impacts than a similar amount of single family housing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I'm not uh, advocating sprawl, but there are other cities that are smaller, um, you know, living in and, and densifying some of the quote unquote second tier cities. Uh, you know, when I was at, in Portland uh, in uh, 2000, in the early mid 2000s, uh, that was considered a second tier city. It wasn't quite like the, it was starting to be like the hot and hop in metropolis that it is today, but that's a neighborhood that can be really walkable that is densifying in some areas. So definitely not advocating sprawls, definitely not saying everyone needs to get a plot and move to the exurbs. Uh, but definitely saying that all of the really dense coastal cities like Boston and New York are going to face really unique challenges. And if you don't want to deal with those challenges, you know, Burlington, Vermont is really great. Um, and, you know, Louisville, Kentucky might be some place that you consider. And just that there are other places that are starting to rethink. And I, I think that when we think about some of these quote unquote second tier cities, um, we think that these folks don't necessarily care about stopping sprawl. But communities that have engaged in really great uh, shared leadership and decision making from their residents and good participatory governance processes, they tend to make transit oriented decisions. I think Salt Lake City is a really, really great example of that. I think about 15, maybe it's 20 years at this point, Salt Lake City went through this planning process where they said, hey, the sprawl is getting a little bit out of control. We don't have a good transportation network. People have to drive everywhere. We're facing all of these different challenges and extending our infrastructure because it's kind of expensive for the city to lay these pipes for water and for electricity and things like that. Um, and they, they worked really closely with residents and found that a lot of the values that they had be they liberal, be they conservative, a lot of the values were around living close to their neighbors and having great community. And they were able to redevelop a number of their urban areas to have a really great transit oriented development where there's public transportation and the ability to bike and the ability to walk. So th th this sort of future 
because I think I think when we think about places like Atlanta, we're like, oh my God, it's endless suburban sprawl. But one of the things that we can change about these spaces is, is to start making decisions to densify some of these areas. New York, I grew up there. It's an amazing city. It just has some issues. And if you don't want to deal with them, you might consider a different place. So absolutely no to the suburban sprawl. I'm not about the exurbs. See, um, I have a question, Kate. Yeah. Um, so I feel like there's a there are great programs in a lot of cities and with a lot of utilities uh, incentives for disconnecting your downspout or mm -hmm. getting some kind of rebate or a, a great discount on uh, energy efficient appliances or mm -hmm. insulation. But there's a real gap for renters and um, and how do we incentivize land uh, landlords? to because they pass on that cost to the renter yeah. they're paying the utility bill like how do we incentivize um a, making a better situation for people who rent yeah i think that there's incentivize and then there's also the other side of the coin is how we penalize and i'll speak to that point first before i loop back to talking about the way that we incentivize it for um, a growing rental class uh which, which is a lot of people are renting if you're in my generation if you're elder millennial or younger like getting a home is real hard right now um, especially if you're in major urban areas. Um, but the penalties can be pretty big. So Portland um, is one of many, many cities that has a uh, has your sewage rates calculated based on the amount of impermeable versus permeable pavement. So if you've got like a really big lawn or if you've got water caption, capture versus having an asphalt driveway or you know a, a big deck, you can reduce your sewage bill by capturing some of that water on your property. Um, one of the things that we found in Richmond, Virginia, which also has that, is it means that some people who can least afford to make those modifications to their homes are getting slammed with insane sewage bills. You have families where you have intergenerational families living together. Everybody's working a minimum wage job and like getting your calculator out for how, how little that is month to month, regardless of where in the country you live at this point. Um, and they are occasionally, and it, now that the rains are becoming more frequent in Richmond, Virginia, they're getting hit with these, uh, you know, surprise, surprise sewage bill, $300 for a month. If you're on a fixed income, that's something that's really challenging. Um, so we also need to think about uh, getting rid of some of these um, penalties that are meant to be really helpful and encourage certain groups of people to make modifications to their property, but are having these really negative externalities on the people who can least afford to shoulder the burden. Um, in terms of the incentives, I think that that's where we need to co take collective responsibility. And, then, and until we decommodify land and say that like really land Lords, you need to rethink sort of your amount of profit and what's ethical about the amount of profits that you're able to derive from your property. Um, we need to be looking at collective efforts. I think Massachusetts has an interesting model um, where they, uh, for, for lead abatement, uh, the entire Northeast is just covered in lead, which we know is not great for young children. Um, something that I think is kind of interesting, when I used to work for public housing, Public housing doesn't have a lot of money, as you can imagine. Um, so residents who worked in the shipyards would take home big canisters of paint from the shipyards, which were lead paint because it's really durable and just paint their homes. So people were constantly reintroducing lead into abated homes. Um, but Massachusetts offers uh, zero interest loans and a lot of grants to people to remove lead from their homes to help reduce some of that, reduce some of that burden. So I think looking at collective incentives that come from the government level, is that fair? I don't know, like that we all shoulder the tab for making this person's property like safer. I don't know, question mark, but I, we just know that it, to some extent it needs to get done. Um, and ideally that, you know, rent should, or that rent increase shouldn't be passed on, but there's a lot more to say about housing and the housing crisis. Thank you. But get rid of the penalties because they're ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, if anybody has another question, now's the time to ask it, but I think we're starting to wind down. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, this has been wonderful. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Feel free to, to reach out. Looks like Olga dropped some of my information in the chat. I'd love to um, you know, connect and talk with you folks. But thanks, thanks so much for, for being here and for joining.